This video is part two of two for art history of the Heian period. If you haven't already watched part one, please click on the annotation to watch the introduction and early Heian period. This video will cover the mid and late Heian period. Remember how in the Nara period, lands were taken back under direct imperial control and reformed? Well, by the Heian period, land had largely been gifted to these aristocratic clans, particularly to the Fujiwara. The Fujiwara clan, who had taken an active and dominant role in the imperial government, was a powerful political force until the middle of the 12th century. Thus, the Middle Han period, during which they were at the height of their influence, is often referred to as the Fujiwara period. In 858, the Fujiwara established a new form of government, where they appointed themselves as regents called Sesho and civil dictators called Kampaku. Through these roles, they ruled in the name of the emperor. By this time, they had intermarried with the Yamato so extensively that the head of the Fujiwara clan was usually the grandfather or uncle and maybe father-in-law of the emperor. What this means is when a Fujiwara consort of the emperor produced an heir apparent, the emperor was encouraged to abdicate and his Fujiwara father-in-law was named Sesho for the new emperor, and then Kampaku when the young ruler came of age. Needless to say, they had a lot of control over the government. Powerful clan leaders and Buddhist temples also pressured the emperor to have their shōen or estate taxes exempt. The shōen landowners stayed close to the capital while affairs were increasingly left to local estate managers. Under these managers were peasant farmers who worked their land more or less as bonded serfs. As land holdings were originally imperial gifts and changed hands with intermarriage and inheritance, the Fujiwara carefully maneuvered control over the best sources of revenue at the time. During this time, Japanese culture flourished. It was a largely peaceful time and the aristocracy had the leisure time and financial means for aesthetic pursuits, such as writing poetry and playing instruments, blending incense and religious activities like copying Buddhist sutras and putting on elaborate Buddhist ceremonies. These times have been described by the art historian Sir George Sampson as the rule of taste. Previously due to the strong influence of the Chinese style, Japanese painters copied the tall, rugged mountains of China despite the fact that Japanese topography was completely different from China's. As the Japanese shifted away from their Chinese models, paintings began to reflect Japan as the Japanese people saw it. The mid Heian period is seen as the golden age of Yamato-e. They began to distinguish between the Japanese style and the Chinese style, referred to as Kara-e and Yamato-e. Yamato meaning Japan and Kara meaning China. Yamato-e is distinguished by a softer landscape and rich but not brash palette of colors. The landscapes are lower hills with gentle valleys, much like the area around Heian. In contrast, Kara'e images continued in Chinese narrative themes, ferocious mythical creatures, and the landscape of rugged mountains. Etoki is a form of picture telling that developed to explain Buddhist principles. Using an emaki, or hand picture, or a painted hand scroll, or rooms with paintings called a picture hall, a monk would point to a picture and explain the story of either Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, or another important Buddhist monk, most notably Prince Shotoku, who is often attributed to bringing Buddhism to Japan from China. The earliest examples of etoki were performed to small groups of the ruling class upon special request. Later, it would move out of picture halls and become more of a public performance. Around 11th century, music would be composed to accompany the stories. Monks often performed etoki in exchange for gifts of money or food. Traveling etoki performing monks would set up and preach on bridges or roadsides for any audience. It was a way to teach the illiterate about religion in an entertaining form of storytelling. The Shotoku Taishi Eden illustrated events of the life of Prince Shotoku in a group of 10 paintings in a geographic sequence, rather than a chronological one. Read right to left, each episode is labeled with a cartouche affixed to the painting. The narrative elements are fitted into pockets of open space between the mountains, rocks, and trees, and the vertical composition is held together by the landscape, which flows around the episodes and leads the eye. 
This use of mountain defined space to unify a composition while at the same time separating figurative passages is a Chinese pictorial convention seen frequently in the paintings of Tang Dynasty. While using a Chinese pictorial convention, the artist makes sure to make a clear distinction between the landscape of China and Japan. In the two panels of Shintennoji, it is shown in the lowlands of Naniwa, in what is now called Osaka. On the left side are the mountains of China, tall and irregularly massed together, some of them displaying the sharply undercut faceting frequently seen in Kara'e landscape, but seldom are used in Yamato-e. At the top is a magical flying chariot where Shotoku travels across the sea to China. Thus, this work is an interesting use of Chinese pictorial convention, but using it to illustrate a secular native theme, the prince's biography, with new elements. In the 10th century, with the rising importance of Pure Land sects of the Japanese Buddhism, the focus of aristocratic worship in the Middle Heian period shifted from Dainichi no Rai and the mandalas of Shingon Buddhism to a belief in the rebirth of the Western Paradise, or Pure Land, one of Dainichi's transcendental Buddhas, Amida. New image types were developed to satisfy the devotional needs of these sects. These include the Raigozu, which depict Amida Buddha along with the attendant Bodhisattvas, Kenan and Seishi descending from heaven to welcome the souls of the faithful departed to Amida's western paradise. In contrast to the complex and straight disciplines of the rituals of the Shingon school, anyone who sought salvation merely had to repeat the Nembutsu mantra, Namu Amida Butsu, or Hail to Amida Buddha to be reborn in Amida's paradise. Not bad, huh? Well, a lot of other people thought so too. This teaching didn't just spread through the aristocracy, but Amida was the first sect to extend to the lower ranks of society, aka the vast majority of the population. Prior to this, Buddhism required reading of Chinese text, so common people who didn't possess this skill, pretty much everyone who wasn't an aristocratic male, saw Buddhism simply as magic rituals to prevent calamities, promote a good harvest, and ease the path of their loved ones into the next world, not really reaching nirvana as you pretty much need to be a monk and dedicate your life to that. Instead, the Nembutsu mantra promised a better afterlife, where even a peasant would live like an aristocrat in Amida's paradise. An irresistible offer at a time when the gap between the aristocrat and commoner was perhaps never bigger. A noted early example of a raigozu is the Phoenix Hall in the Byodoin, a temple in Uji, Kyoto. The site was originally a summer home, but was converted into a temple in 1052, and in 1053, the Hodo was dedicated. When looked at across the pool with its reflection in the waters, the building's architecture is basically meant to look like Amida's paradise. When walking into the Hodo, you are surrounded by images of the Raigozu. At the center is an over-life-size Amida Buddha on a tall lotus blossom pedestal. On the upper part of the walls are small wooden images of celestial nymphs called Tenen, monks, and musicians. The figures on the wall sit or stand on cloud forms, some playing musical instruments or dancing. The Amida image was created by the foremost sculptor of the period, Zhou Cho. Zhou Cho created new proportions for the Amida image, using the height of the head from the chin to the brow as a basic unit for the entire figure. The vertical projection of the statue from the bottom of the legs to the hairline is exactly equal to the distance between both knees. The image gives off a remarkable feeling of stability and calm. The image is sculpted using yoseiji, or multiple blocks, a technique probably developed from the Chinese split and rejoin method of construction. Created with 53 pieces of wood, the multiple block technique did not allow deep carving of the drapery or facial details, but Zhou Cho used this limitation to his advantage, creating a style of sculpture that was light and ethereal rather than heavy and overbearing like the Jinjoji Yakshi. The multiple block technique allowed for more dynamic movement, not really showcased in this particular sculpture, but it also facilitated the production of work in a studio tradition. The master could sketch the image, indicate the joining parts, and the apprentices make the preliminary sculpting for various parts. Then it may be transferred to the site, assembled, and finished by the master sculptor. The figure is accompanied by an openwork gold halo that meets a round canopy at the top. The detail of the work contrasts with the smooth surface of the Amida, underlining the calm, quiet demeanor of the image itself. 
In the late Heian period, the imperial clan began to actively wrest control of the government from the Fujiwara to rebuild its own financial strength. Emperor Go Sanjo was the first emperor in many decades to be born of a non-Fujiwara mother, so he was able to resist many of the Fujiwara demands. He established a concept called Insei, or government by cloistered retired emperors. His idea was this. He would abdicate the throne and become a monk at a Buddhist temple he founded. He would continue to govern the country through his son, the reigning emperor, but since he would no longer be holding an official position, he could receive donations of the land. This way, they would collect the income generated through these lands, as well as from the intermediary of temples that he and his family had founded. However, Emperor Gosanjo died shortly after abdicating the throne and was never able to put his plan to action. Instead, his son Shirakawa followed his lead with great success. Along with his son Toba, the period of these two's rule outrivaled the opulence of even the most powerful Fujiwara members. The chief focus of the imperial family, as you can guess, was on the founding of Yamato clan temples. Between the late 11th and middle of the 12th century, the retired emperor and his kin and loyal subjects dedicated a new Shinto worship hall every year and founded a Buddhist temple every five years. Unfortunately, none of the temples built for Shirakawa or Toba or their relatives and devoted subjects have survived. The Sanju Sangen, though, is perhaps most impressive for housing 1,001 images of the 11-headed, 1,000-armed Sanju Kennen. The original hall was destroyed in a fire, but rebuilding began immediately to house the images that were saved from the fire. The simplicity of the architecture with exposed beams contrasts with the complicated details of the myriad of Kennen images and the statues of Kennen's attendants. 156 canon sculptures were saved, and they form the nucleus of the Sanji San Gendo installation. They're mostly in a frontal position, with the largest pair of arms pressed together in prayer. Another set of arm rests just below the waist, and a third pair holds a monk's staff and a trident-topped staff, a symbol of the defense against evil. The rest of the arms are separate, some holding more objects. The skirts and scarves are formed with shallow carving and fall in soft folds over the body. The later 13th century additions are attributed to Tanke. They have heavier drapery folds over the legs and patterns created by the garments flow over the entire area between the waist and feet. There's also a greater gradation of the size of arms, demonstrating the new interest in volumetric figures being realistically presented, which developed during the Kamakura period. At the same time, they maintain a fidelity to older forms for a uniform look. Upon encountering the images, one is faced with a sea of figures too fast to comprehend from a single view. A great deal of time and money were devoted to secular projects as well. There are two distinct painting styles of emaki, referred to as otoko-e, men's pictures, and onna-e, or women's pictures. While otoko air came to refer to the monochrome or lightly colored pictures that relied on the Chinese style of calligraphic line to convey visual image, ona e was a reaction to this genre and leaned towards more Yamato e style of painting. The Genji Monogatari Yamaki, an example of ona e, would have been an ambitious project completed by five teams, each team including an aristocrat noted for his calligraphy and cultural sophistication, the principal artist called Sumigaki, or painter who draws in the black ink, and artists who specialized in the application of traditional pigments. It's suspected that all 54 chapters of Genji Monogatari were illustrated with one to three paintings per chapter in a set of 10 scrolls. Today, only 20 pictures survive. The sumigaki would plan the composition and sketch it on paper in fine black ink lines. At the same time, he would make notes on the sheet about colors he wanted, and then the pigment specialist would apply each layer of paint within but obscuring the original lines. In the final stage, the sumigaki would review the illustration, perhaps changing a few details, and paint in the face details. This painting technique of applying layers of paint over an underdrawing is called sukuri-e, meaning made up or construction. 
A major theme of Genji Monogatari was the concept of mono no aware, translated as the pathos of things or the moving quality of experience. It's an awareness of the impermanence or the transience of things which heightens the appreciation of their beauty and evokes a gentle sadness at their passing. The illustrations use pictorial conventions to help illustrate these moments of high emotional intensity. The fuki nuki yatai, or blown off roof and odd angle of perspective, not only seamlessly depicts indoor and outdoor activities, but also provides a better view of the space, much like a rake or inclined stage. The presence or absence of space in which the figures could move also contributes insight into their feelings. Colors and patterns heighten the mood of the scene. All elements come together to create for a strong impression of mono no aware. A second major theme is the chain of karmic consequences Genji generated when he committed one great sin against his father. In his youth, he fell in love with his father's youngest wife. A child was born from their liaison, and the baby boy was passed off as the emperor's own son. In other words, Genji's son became Genji's brother. When Genji is in middle age, his youngest wife has an extramarital affair that results in a son that Genji decides he must publicly accept as his own, just as the old emperor had done with Genji's son. The illustration of this scene would have been unveiled from right to left as the image is rolled open. First you see the empty courtyard, originally painted silver but now tarnished. The veranda, placed at a sharp angle, almost keeps us out. With a peak of the edge of a 12-layered robe, we tread carefully through the curtains into the room. You get the sense of entering a very private space and moment. The sharp angle and the edge of the painting makes the room very small, almost claustrophobic. The red lacquered plates filled with food indicate that a ceremony is in place. Genji is at the top holding a baby while ladies in waiting are below. At the extreme upper left corner is the baby's mother, her presence depicted by a mound of fabric. Genji, uncomfortable with the ritual, aware that the attendants know that the baby is not his, is also physically awkward, jammed into this constricted corner of the image. Like the pressure of society forcing him to put on a good face in a bad situation, the architecture forces Genji into a cramped position. In the Minori or the Rites chapter, Genji's true love, Lady Murasaki, is dying. Genji's daughter, by another wife, who Lady Murasaki raised as her own, comes from the Imperial Palace to be with her. One stormy evening, Genji visits Murasaki, and the three sit together, watching the wind whip the shrubs and grasses in the garden. When Genji first built his mansion, he planted his garden to be beautiful year-round, reaching peak in the springtime, Murasaki's favorite season. Now as they gaze at it, it seems to be nothing but a tangled mess of vines. Again, the architecture plays an important role. As Genji knows Murasaki is gravely ill, he dreads that she will die and senses that his grief will be nearly too much to bear. The angles are just as steep as the previous image, but unlike that one, the figures appear almost immediately as the scroll is unrolled. Murasaki is near the top, leaning on an armrest. Her adopted daughter is just below the angle formed by the upper beam of the wall and the cloth curtain of state. Genji appears at the bottom of the incline, nearest to the veranda. Lastly, as the architecture disappears, it leads to the wind-ravaged garden. His anguish over Murasaki as she drifts towards death is suggested by the space he occupies, between the imminent death and the tangled shrubbery in the cold. The Shigi-san Engiyamaki, translated to the scroll of the legend of Mount Shigi, is one of the earliest examples of the type of narrative that became very popular in the late Heian and Kamakura periods. The Engi is the history of the founding of a particular Buddhist establishment. This one is about a temple called Chogo Son Shiji, deep in the mountains north of Nara, and the magical tales of its founder, a monk called Myorin. The first two scrolls depict the miracles Myorin wrought, chastising a wealthy and greedy farmer by making his granary fly through the air to the top of the mountain. Then he heals Emperor Daigo when all other attempts had failed, causing a rare Buddhist entity, a sword boy, to appear to the emperor. The text serves as a legitimization of the temple, indicating that worshippers there would benefit from the magical powers of its founder. This engi is in the otoko-e style, made first by painting the outlines of the figures and the natural scenery in dark gray brushstrokes. 
for colors, he used thin pigments that would not obscure his earlier lines. This allowed him to depict figures in active stances and utilize the calligraphic strokes to suggest movement. This gives the illustration a lively, fresh quality in perfect harmony with its subject matter. Another major amaki surviving in the late Han period is the Ban Dai Nagon Ekotoba. Attributed to Tokiwa no Mitsunaga, it tells the story of the Oten Gate of the Imperial Palace burning down in 866. It was later proved that the fire was set by the head of the Otomo clan in an attempt to discredit a court rival, the minister of the left, Minamoto no Makoto. Found guilty, Lord Otomo was sent into exile. An excellent example of narrative painting, this image illustrated the surprising way that the truth comes out with amazing economy of space. Rather than each scene having its own panel, the events unfold right next to each other. The story goes something like this. One day in the market district, two boys begin to fight. One boy's father, a retainer of Lord Otomo, rushes out to break them apart. Underneath this, illustrations show how the father beats the other child severely. The second boy's father, a low-ranking government worker, rages at the first boy's father for hurting his son. Beside himself with anger, the second child's father blurts out that if the world knew what he knows about the retainer and the master, Lord Otomo, they would be severely punished. Heard by everyone in the neighborhood, the threat was discussed in whispers until it finally came to the attention of the Metropolitan Police. The second father tells the authorities that he saw the retainer and Lord Otomo climb down from the palace gate just before it burst into flames. While the conversation between the fathers isn't shown, there are people grimacing as he beats the child. The figure with his mouth open shows how the rumor spreads by word of mouth, passing from person to person. The Amaki is an interesting blend of the sukuri e scene in the Genji Monogatari Amaki and the free otoko e style of the Shigisan Engi Amaki. The artist uses an elegant and controlled calligraphic line to sketch out his figures, but also thickly applies bright colors. The unidealized human behavior central to both the Shigisan Engi and the Ban Dai Nagon demonstrates perhaps a new awareness and interest outside of the aristocratic circle. By the end of the Heian period, the cloistered world of the court was beginning to collapse, and perhaps these works, at least on the part of some of the aristocracy, were an attempt to break through the bars of their gilded cage. After Toba's death in 1156, disputes over secession between the Imperial Yamato and the Fujiwara clans resulted in two rebellions, the Hogen in 1156 and the Heiji or the Heike in 1160. The two opposing clans sought help from the military clans, the Taira and the Minamoto. The disputes concluded with the Genpei Civil War, which lasted from 1180 to 1185. The war was fought throughout the country but ended with an epic sea battle that almost completely wiped out the Taira clan, and the women of the Taira clan leapt to their watery graves, clutching the infant emperor Antoku. So traumatic was this loss that there's even ghost stories about their death. You can check it out over here. The victorious Minamoto established a new form of military dictatorship, the Bakufu, in which the military clan oversaw the governing of the nation until 1868 and the imperial restoration. And we'll cover that in the next video. Thanks so much for watching this video. I'm doing a whole series on Japanese art, everything from prehistoric to Heian period, modern Japan to contemporary art and pop culture. Be sure to subscribe to catch them all. Special thanks to our Patreons supporters, I really appreciate your contributions. If you like little art talks and you want to help us keep making more great new videos, you can check us out on patreon.com slash littlearttalks to see all the neat things that are available. And I'll see you guys next time with the Kamakura period.